بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما We've been talking about the nafs. Today we go back to talking about the nafs. So we discussed in previous sessions that the nafs goes through stages. So al nafs al amara, then al nafs al lawama, then al nafs al mutmainna. We've been talking about al nafs al amara. So the nafs that drives us to unhealthy behaviors. Now we move on to talking about the next stage which is al-nafs al So first there is a stage where we recognize that our nafs is driving us to behaviors that are unhealthy. Then there is a stage where we become more and more aware of that and we start to censure that nafs. We start to push back. The nafs al amara is pushing us one way, the nafs al lawama pushes back, and then eventually we achieve balance in the nafs al mutmainna. So, Al-Nafs uh, al the first point I want to make is that there's a sense of intensity, mubalagha, uh, in Al-Nafs al and Al-Nafs al-Amara. This isn't just that the Nafs al-Amara drives us to unhealthy choices once, and that Nafs al drives back once. It's that the word Al-Nafs al-Amara has in it this idea of intensity, that there's this repeated drive. So in order to match that intensity, the nafs al has to have the same amount of intensity and more perhaps to push back. So when we think about these tools that we set out to learn, it's important to recognize the nafs al amara, its tricks, its intensity, become aware of them, and then meet it with the same intensity. So if we try some of these tools and they help, but not enough, that's just, that's a great sign. It's a signal that we need to add more tools or we need to master those tools in order to, to hit back. The general rule with behaviors, strong habits and addictive behaviors is that the strength of your treatment and intervention and pushback needs to meet the intensity of your addictive behavior. And once you reach that threshold, it's a number, it's a graph. Once you meet that threshold, then that's when you start to get traction. And the sooner you can get to that, the better. So two things that can really help with that is number one, being convinced that the tools that you use work. So being convinced that the tools that you use work. And when you are able to understand the tools, perhaps see other people use those tools and be successful with them, and then maybe understand the science behind the tools, like see that they've been studied in large populations and shown to be effective. That can really give us the confidence to then go ahead and implement those tools effectively, as opposed to sitting in this gray area of, does this really work? Is this, is this going to work? So on and so forth. So number one, having that belief in the tool. And then number two, having the belief in ourselves that we can change. So studies repeatedly show in laboratory animals and humans that when people have a belief in themselves that they can change, that's one of the number one predictors of success. So your belief in your ability to change is one of the number one predictors of success. So again, matching the nafs al-amara that drive within us to unhealthy behaviors with the strong with the similar strength of intensity of treatment and then just getting to work with it if it's not here then we move it up here if it's not here we move it up here through a trial and error process until we till we get there and then not falling for the pitfall of does this really work or not by the way what we're learning here it's not a way it's a set of tools and what you want to do is use those tools that work for you and stay open to tools that perhaps don't work for you. Maybe it's just a matter of mastering them. And then also there'll be tools outside of here 
that we learn in other places as well that we can go ahead and implement. And so putting all of these things together are, are important to increase our chances of success. So we talked about in the past, how do we push back uh, the nafs al-amara? So we talked about Imam al-Ghazali. He talked about the nafs that's arrogant and wild with arrogance and out of control with arrogance. So we, don't, we won't rehash that, but a point I want to make with that is when we talked about that, Imam al-Ghazali, when he talks about how to push back on the nafs, he talks about it with several different strategies. So he, he takes this nafs al-amara and he has a intensity of strategies that he uses in order for us to then push back on that. And you can divide and he uses the aqab. So the nafs al-amara is a drive within us and then we use our aql to push back and censure, censure that drive and push back. So we talked about how Imam al-Ghazali says that the person that is nafs is out of control with arrogance. It's because they see themselves as better than others. And it's because of this belief that they're better than others because of certain things about themselves. So now you can break up this behavior into three things. There's a trigger, there's a, a thought that arises, and then you put that thought on trial. So number one, Imam al-Ghazali talks about how a person, they can go into certain environments where they see other people that they generally believe to be themselves to be better than. So they see somebody younger than them. And they see that, by the way, this is in Bidayat al-Hidayat. They see that person as younger than them, and they find a way to feel better than them then they see somebody older than them and they're triggered and they find a way to see themselves as better than that person so on and so forth so there's the trigger then there's the thought i'm better than this younger person because i'm better than this older person because so on and so forth and then there's the trial there's putting those thoughts on trial so then what imam al-ghazali says is he, i'm paraphrasing it but he's essentially saying, put those thoughts on trial. When you see that younger person, are you better than them because they're younger than you? Or has this person, or is it the opposite? Has this person had enough time to sin as you have, or as we have? When you see somebody older than you, are you better than that person? Hasn't this person been able to worship a lot longer than you? When you see somebody that's more knowledgeable than you, there's other thoughts that you can come up with when there, you see somebody that's less knowledgeable than you. There's other thoughts that you can come up to put that thought on trial. Somebody less knowledgeable than you, that person sins and they're not aware of it, whereas we sin and we're aware of it, and then so on and so forth. So much content on how to push back on this one thought of I'm better than others one thought of i'm better than others and so many different so much ammunition given to how we can put that thought on trial so point number one is this idea exists within our tradition of recognizing certain situations number two recognizing certain thoughts and then number three putting those thoughts on trial and pushing back point number two is that the intensity of pushing back on that nafs needs to be as strong as the intensity of that nafs pushing back on us. And inshallah, with, the, with that, we'll go into the text on chapter six. It talks about how we've come to a point where we've looked at our triggers. We've looked at different thoughts or red flag thoughts that these triggers come up with, uh, result in. And then we've taken a look at some errors in thinking that make us prone to want to engage in our addictive behavior. So triggers, thoughts, and those thinkings lead to our addictive behavior. 
now that we thoroughly understand this concept, again, because we don't want to think about this in a superficial way, like it's some sort of like intellectual stimulating thing. We want to look at this like we need to master this in order to really overcome these problems that have sort of aren't going away uh, despite our best efforts. So now that we've thoroughly understand how this works, how triggers convert to cravings or urges, now it's time to develop a, a toolbox of skills that will enable us to get through the cravings and the urges to engage in this addictive behavior or any behavior that we're dealing with. This is the time, like we are in a dopamine rich environment. It's not, do you have an addiction? It's what addiction do you have? This is the, t this is the time where there's digital addictions, there's chemical addictions, and it's less about like, is this pertinent to us? It's more about, have we reached a stage where we're aware that this is pertinent? to us. As we practice these new skills, you want to pay attention to which ones are most useful to you. So you don't want to focus on one that just seems really foreign or odd or bizarre or just kind of not in line with something we're used to and then miss a bunch of skills that you may be open to. So, and you want to practice and see which one's kind of like fit with me or which ones are the low hanging fruit that I can start implementing, implement those and start implementing them now and, and really building up your skills with it and try to stay curious about the other ones. From this chapter forward, based on our observations and reflections about our experiences, trying out these different techniques from this chapter forward, we'll start creating our own customized plan for our own addictive behaviors. So we've talked about our addictive brain, our, our nafs al-ammara, and how, and strategies we can use to defeat it, specifically by making our rational brain stronger, specifically by training our aql. The red flag thoughts that we've identified in previous sessions are byproducts of that nafs al-amara, that addicted brain, that drive within us. This is the part of us that finds ways to justify going back to our addictive behavior, to feed those uncomfortable urges. With practice, though, we can censure these thoughts, we can challenge these thoughts, and we can outsmart our lower addicted brain. We can outsmart our nafs al-amara. When you do that, when we repeatedly outsmart it, our rational minds start to become the new normal. You know, like basketball, you can dribble with your right hand. If you're right-handed, it comes easy. Dribbling with your left hand, a little bit harder. Soccer kicking, if you're right-handed, Maybe kicking with your right foot, your dominant foot is easier. Kicking with your left foot is harder. Um, same thing with any sport or writing. Writing with your right hand, if your right hand dominant is easier than writing with your left hand. Now, let's say you are in a situation where you now are a professional soccer player or a professional basketball player. You no longer have the luxury of just using what you're comfortable with naturally. Now it's time to utilize every part of you, dig deep and utilize every part of you in order to overcome this new challenge. Same thing with addiction. We have ways of thinking that are comfortable for us, but now it's important to develop new ways of thinking. And as we develop those new ways of thinking, it's going to feel abnormal, bizarre at first. Like just like writing with your non-dominant hand or dribbling or kicking with your non-dominant limb. But after a while, after you go through that process of struggling, 
then it becomes normal because now you've wired your brain and it operates in the same way you check out and can dribble with your not dominant hand. Now you can check out and dip, dribble with your left hand. And that's where we go from nafs al-amara to nafs al-lawama to nafs al mutmainna where now we have this tranquil, balanced self, which is able to regulate itself automatically. So there's this period where we have to train, challenge, do things, step out of our comfort zone and just do it essentially in a, in, until it becomes normal. And that's what fake it till you make it comes in. That you, you, you'll hear in the rooms of recovery. Not that you're being inauthentic. What you're doing is you're going through the motions. And although it doesn't feel real, you keep going through those motions until it becomes real. So if it's abnormal for you to think about your emotions or talk about your emotions or talk about your thoughts or do this psychologic stuff, it's you know, a lot of times we come to this simply because we're sick and tired of our old ways and sick and tired of being sick and tired and we're just ready to try something not necessarily because we're eager to rush into these new ways of doing things. So once we're able to just go through the motions, then they start to become a normal part of us. Same thing with re-engaging in the Dean. A lot of times we start coming around the circles of knowledge, the circles of remembrance, coming to the masjid, and part of us feels like, do I even belong here? Am I an imposter? If people figure me out, then they'll run me out of here. And, you know, a lot of that is simply just doing things that we haven't perhaps been accustomed to for a while. And if we can just get over that and fake it till we make it or just put ourselves in those places, amazing things can happen amazing things can happen. So now we're on this, the subsection of thought challenging. As you learn to outsmart your addicted brain, the most powerful cognitive technique you will use is the skill of thought challenging. Like you have this red flag thought that's pushing you to do something that you don't wanna do, then you challenge that with another thought. That's thought challenging. This doesn't just apply to overcoming addiction or cravings. It applies to coping with other problems that stem from irrational thoughts like depression, anxiety, emotional difficulties. You learn to un understand and change your behavior by being scientific, being logical, being real, and sticking to the facts. What does that mean exactly? It means a few things. Number one, to become scientific, you need to practice observing yourself. Any scientist uh, makes observations and they'll even note these observations down. Every scientist has a method to observe the phenomena that they're studying and note it down. This is what changed on this day. This is what changed on that day. This is what changed on another day. So to become scientific, you need to practice observing yourself, monitoring your thoughts and cravings, because this is the phenomenon that's interesting to us. Like, what is this bizarre thing where I want to stop, but I can't? So we get curious about it. And the first step is to observe it, track it, monitor it, and learn about it. So number one, observing yourself. Number two, to become scientific, you need to practice questioning whether your thoughts are rational, especially those that are related to our addictive behavior. Thought challenging is the process of questioning, questioning your thoughts about your addictive behavior by asking yourself, do I have evidence that they're true? Finally, the third point, after you've, question, after you've questioned the evidence for your thoughts, if you find that you don't have evidence, 
to support what you're thinking, then you will identify more rational evidence-based ideas you can tell yourself instead. These new healthy and balanced thoughts will help you make the behavior changes you set out to accomplish in your plan to change. Okay, so let, let's just, all this theoretical stuff, let's put it to an example and, and then we'll wrap up inshallah. So imagine a person, they have a strong urge to engage in their addictive behavior. The first skill that they employ is on a scale from zero to 10, they rate their craving and they rate it as a seven. They think about it and they realize that it's related to the environment that they're in. So now they're in an environment that usually triggers their addictive behavior. And now they've made that connection that this environment leads to a seven on the craving scale. Now that person can try thought challenging by following three steps. Number one, you can think of this as the three T's. Number one, the triggering situation, identifying the triggering situation. Number two, the thoughts, identify those thoughts that are being produced about the drinking or, or, or the using or the pornography or the food addiction or the digital addiction. Identify the thoughts that are pushing you back to the addictive behavior. What, what is the nafs al-amara? How is that driving us? Number three, put those thoughts on trial. Put those thoughts on trial. So number one, this person was in a triggering situation. So the first T, triggering situation. Number two, what are the thoughts that are coming that are, that are driving that person? Let's say this person says, if I just engage in my addictive behavior once, it's no big deal. I can control it. Then number three, they put this thought on trial. They examine the evidence for them. So here's some questions to figure out whether the nafs al-amara that's driving this, if they're rational, um, so to, to figure out if it's the nafs al-amara that's driving these thoughts or if they're rational thoughts. And then the honest answers that, that, that you come up with. So for example, putting the thought on trial and examining the evidence. Number one, is the one time okay? The facts. Yes, one time engaging in your addictive behavior is not going to be completely destructive. Number two, can I control my addictive behavior enough to stop after one time engaging in that behavior? The facts. It's been too long to even remember the last time I stopped after engaging once in my addictive behavior. So the likelihood of that is extremely low. And what they find out, what this person finds out is the idea that they could have just one time with their addictive behavior is exactly the kind of thought that the addicted brain produces to feed that urge to engage in their addictive behavior. Okay, so now they put, put it on trial that this thought is coming from a nafs al-amara, the, the addicted irrational brain. So now we know this is an irrational thought. We all experience these irrational thoughts, whether they're about the addictive behavior or something else. The important question that follows is how can you respond to the thought? When you respond, your goal is to get your mind back on track, to get that nafs back on track, to line it back up with your values and your goals. And of course, with reality, reality short-term, reality long-term. 
And the way you do that is by challenging those thoughts. So you can use an arsenal of thought challenges. Like for example, number one, for me in the past, this way of thinking has led me straight to a full blown relapse into my addictive behavior. So one time engaging my addictive behavior is a big deal. Another thought is there is plenty of evidence that I practically never stop after one time engaging in my addictive behavior. And I'm not able to control myself once I start engaging in that behavior. And there's more. And inshallah, we'll go into more. But the important point is that you have to meet it with that same intensity. And just like Imam al Ghazali gives us a whole slew of tools and thoughts that we can use to counteract the nafs al amara we have to build up a toolbox of thoughts and skills in order to counteract our nafs al amara so inshallah with that we can start with questions then after questions we'll go ahead and and break up and do the check-ins inshallah